Rewind, your week in review is sponsored by the Transportation Development Association of Wisconsin. Sharing one goal, enhancing the quality of life in Wisconsin through the development and maintenance of a strong transportation network. The Transportation Development Association of Wisconsin. It's how we get there. Because I don't want to go backwards. I want to keep going forward together. That's exactly where we're going to go. I'm Steve Walters. And I'm J.R. Ross. And this is the first Rewind of 2019. And we'll put Wisconsin and I was there on hiatus, J.R., because we got a little bit to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, let's show a graphic of the first 16 members of what I'm calling Tony's team. Uh, Governor-elect Evers, who becomes governor on Monday, his key appointees. Okay, let's put up these 16 individuals. Um, before I give my reaction, your reaction, J.R.? Um, he talked about he talks about connecting the dots. He wants people to connect. That's his phrase. He you and I every heard time, that. Connect the dots, and what he means by that is people who can look outside the silos we talk about in state government yep. and the private sector too. Yep. Of like, this is my turf. I'm only going to work on that. He wants people who can break free from those and go across agencies to work on solutions. So that's why he says he's found these people. Now it's notable that he's looked for diversity um, when it comes to gender, when it comes to race. The big complaint you've heard from Republicans so far is what? About geographic diversity. So far, almost most have been from Madison and Milwaukee. Yep. The exceptions have been Peter Barca, uh, current lawmaker uh, from Kenosha. Senator Frostman. Going to revenue. Senator, outgoing Senator Frostman, who's going to workforce development. He's from Sturgeon Bay. The only pick from north of Highway 29, which is the kind of the yeah. traditional demarcation between southern and northern Wisconsin, right? Or we went to the North Woods. Um, he's the only pick from northern Wisconsin. One person from La Crosse. So, but he keeps saying that it's not a matter of where they're from, it's a matter of the talent. And people know he's a governor of all of Wisconsin, not just Madison and Milwaukee, when he goes out and visits the state and is visible, you know, outside of these urban centers. Okay, I want to come back to some of those points. The number of what uh, state government insiders that you and I would call insiders would be six Barca, Frostman, uh, Craig Thompson, who is p was in part of state government, but he lobbied extensively. The only one so far has gotten a lot of blowback from Republicans. Yeah, understand, and I want to get into that. Um, and um, uh, three people from DPI. His mm -hmm. budget chief at DPI will be the state budget director, and two of his uh, top assistants um, from DPI will be cabinet secretaries. Now let's talk about geography. I want to expand. We're showing the pictures of 16 people, but when you add the chief of staff, Maggie Gow, mm -hmm. and the three deputy chiefs of staff that he just appointed today, um, and when you add uh, the new DPI superintendent, who we'll be talking about in a little bit, 21 people closest to Governor Tony Evers, 12 women, 9 men. Mm -hmm. I've covered five governors. I've never seen um, a staff of close aides that healthily, even if that's a word, that are made up of women. Yeah, well, um, the chief of staff, Maggie Gao, announced uh, three deputy chiefs of staff today. Bar Worcester, uh, Melissa Baldoff, um, Carrie Penower, Carrie Pe Penower, um, all four of the top kind of if I do my flowchart of Governor's office are are women. I mean that's remarkable. I don't know that I've seen that. Um, Governor Walker's had three chiefs of staff: Keith Gilks, Eric Shute, uh, Rich Zipper. Back to Eric Shute. Jim Doyle had one chief of staff all eight years. Very Susan unusual. Goodwin. Susan Goodwin, um, and Tommy had I don't know how many. You were there longer than I was for that. Um, but he had female chiefs, at least one female chief of staff, right? I remember right? Oh, yes, who started out. That was his first one. Diane Harmelick was his first chief of staff. So he had at least five or six, John Matthews and Eddie Marion, who hung a guitar on the wall, but that's a different story. So it's not the first to have a female chief of staff, but to have that much of female representation in senior positions, that's the first that I've seen it right. in the time I've covered the Capitol. Right, and we have four African Americans, if you count the lieutenant governor, correct? Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to ask you, JR. Biggest surprise in this list of 16 pictures that we're now showing, or headshots? That's hard to say because the, the, capital, <laughs> the capital rumor mill hates a vacuum. So whenever you don't have information, they try to fill it with like names. So I heard all kinds of names floated for all these jobs. Um, a lot of them didn't end up panning out. Um, he went out of state for one person. Just that one, was Andrea Palm from Washington, DC. Who has a lot of experience with Medicaid, uh, worked in the Yamato administration, Worked for former U.S. Senator Hillary Clinton, so that makes some sense. And finding somebody that has experience when you want to expand 
the Medicaid program. And this is the second governor who's gone to Washington for some health care expertise. Do you remember Dennis Smith? Yes, I do. Who came and then was yes. no more? remember that story we'll quite just, well. We'll just say that. Um, so it, I don't know if they're surprised. Like, I guess I put it this way. I was warned with it, before this whole thing started from people who are close to Evers that don't expect the usual suspects for these jobs. He's one for people who have got uh, professional experience outside of politics, who have maybe even academic experience, um, and it reflects that. You know, you also, with the DPI picks, uh, people are going to wonder, well, does that mean that they're the best people available, or that it was hard to find the right people to fill those jobs, and so he went to people that he knew He knew very from well DPI. and he'd been working with for, yeah. for a long time. Which is an unusual. I mean, you know, Governor Walker was different because he had a, a, an administration in Milwaukee County as county executive that he could pull people from to come with him. Um, Jim Doyle had been at Department of Justice for, what, 12 years? 12 years, three at times. least. Um, he had people that he c pulled over, like Matt Frank became Corrections Secretary. Susan Goode came with him and became his Chief of Staff. Um, Evers is different because DPI is a different beast in politics versus DOJ or Milwaukee County government. It's not a, as political as an organization, it's just a different. So, you know, it was interesting to watch who he pulled over from there. Now, there are still senior jobs to fill in his administration, like legal counsel, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching to see where some other people might end up from DPI because they are people that he knows and he trusts. Right. Um, my nominee for biggest surprise is uh, Representative Barca with Revenue. I mean, I have respect for Mr. Barca. We've interviewed and worked with him for decades. I just didn't see him uh, as a revenue choice, but um, look at, he's a, a former assembly uh, leader of Democrats, mm -hmm. former member of Congress, former member of the SBA administration. I just didn't, to use the term that's in vogue, connect those dots. I had him on my list to watch right away, um, both him and Frostman, and this is why. When uh, Peter Barker was pushed out by his fellow Democrats as a Senate Minority Leader, you know, he's, he'd been around the block. He had been in the Assembly, left, um, ran a special election for Congress, won a seat in 1993. Right. Lost it for a full term in '94, if I remember correctly. Went to the Clinton administration, came back to the Newman, Capitol. Newman took him out. Yep. Yeah. Came back to the Capitol in 2008, I want to say. Um, mm, okay. Ten somewhere around there. So after you've been around that kind of, you know, you had that kind of experience, and you are pushed out as leader, where do you go from there? What What's your upward trajectory? There really wasn't one for Barca. So I knew he was looking for something else to do. The question was, what was his off ramp for being? a state lawmaker, this was a landing spot for him. With Frostman, it made sense because, if you recall, he was the uh, executive director of the Door County Economic Development Corporation before yeah. he ran for the state senate seat yes. in a special election. He resigned from that seat uh, to put the, aside those concerns that he was you know, had that job while running. So this is a guy who gave up his job to run for state senate in a tough seat, won at special election, then lost it in the November rematch with Andre Jacques, a state lawmaker from De Pere. So this is kind of like a way to give him a spot. Now, he also has experience. You know, he's worked in economic development. Um, he's worked in workforce development. He's, he's got the background. Yeah. yeah. So he has the background. But also, this is uh, a place that he gets to land, you know, and this is kind of terms that we use in politics. You know, he lands at a landing spot after stepping up to run for that Senate Okay, seat. and here's my theory on Frostman. I did an exit interview with him. He was absolutely fascinating. Uh, doesn't take himself too seriously. Mm -hmm. He's only 34. Here's my theory. Uh, in interviews with both of us, Governor Evers said, I'm not going to try in my budget to, uh, to dissolve, blow up WEDC, um, and I will live with the terms from the lame duck that I cannot name a new CEO until September. Uh, Frostman uh, came out of economic development in Door County. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a change with Mr. Hogan as CEO of WEDC that Mr. Frostman is the next secretary there. That's just a theory, not operating on when any inside information. I interviewed go Governor like Evers this week. He said he is not going to put in his budget any proposal to scrap WEDIC. Um, he is acknowledging that Republicans aren't going to go along with that. He also is not going to announce a new WEDIC leader until September 1. Yes. He didn't close the door to Mark Hogan, but it would be difficult to see how people I talk to at least that how Tony Evers keeps Governor Walker's main economic development guy in that position after he gets the power back to appoint that. And rem remember, what Republicans did in this lame duck session was say, okay, we're going to make so the board of WEDIC is comprised of majority of appointments from the Assembly Speaker, Robin Voss, Senate Majority Leader, Scott Fitzgerald, yep. Republicans, 
until September 1st. The board will have the power to appoint the secretary slash CEO. And then the governor gets that back September 1 when the board appointments go back to how they are now or were before the change. So this was intended as a way for Republicans to, in their minds, protect Weedick and keep Hogan in that job. Okay, and uh, we're going to hear from uh, Governor Evers, Governor-elect Evers, in just a few minutes. I want to talk about you, as you alluded to, Craig Thompson as the Department of Transportation Secretary. What was your reading when Senator Fitzgerald put out that statement saying, some of my members are concerned that he has special interest contacts, and what that means is that he advocated for a tax increase in the last couple budget cycles. Uh, Big problems for uh, Mr. Thompson getting confirmed? It depends. You know, they, I haven't heard of a Senate caucus yet to get a temperature of all the 19 members come January, for, come Monday. Um, so a couple of questions that I have, and without any answers yet. How are they going to approach this? So typically, secretaries give a hearing, a public hearing before a standing committee, a committee vote, and a floor vote. So are they going to have a committee vote on Thompson? You could, in theory, just saying, again, a theory, have Thompson operate a sector without ever confirming him, you know, that's an option. Um, if you do do a committee hearing and a committee vote, which the transportation may believe has people like, um, who are kind of like longer term lawmakers have a hard time seeing really being a, like Jerry Petrosky, I wonder would they actually oppose a secretary, a pick of a governor on something like this? And then final chapter, will they go to a floor vote? Now, long standing rule has been in both chambers that you only take something on the floor if you have a, the votes need to pass it in your caucus, the majority caucus. Or confirm. Yeah. Pass so or confirm. So if they go to the floor at 1914 and have a bunch of Republicans vote no, would people like Jerry Bukowski, Rob Coles, Luther Olson, you know, go on the list, would say, well, I'm not going to vote for this guy who is the governor-elect's pick to lead an agency. It's, it's his cabinet. W but How would that happen? One other possibility is all 14 Democrats vote to confirm Craig Thompson because it's their governor's choice. Mm -hmm. Then you got to pick up three Republican governors. But will they allow that? And that that's the, que the questions that I have. I, I don't know that that's been decided at all. Right. But that's the question I have is how they operate. If they do do a floor vote, and again, you can let them serve without having a confirmation vote right. indefinitely. Okay. Let's close this segment this way. Um, uh, Wisconsin and I interviewed Governor Evers, Governor-elect Evers. Let's listen to him. I asked him, give us your, th your themes of your inaugural address on Monday, and then do you have a plan B if Mr. Thompson's uh, nomination is blocked? Let's listen to that, please. <laughs> Summarize the theme of your inauguration speech on Monday. Sure. I'll be talking mostly about issues of um, Wisconsin values, about civil discourse, about finding common ground, about giving people hope. The bottom line is if we want to accomplish something as a state, we have to look beyond political parties and the politics of resentment and really focus on what's important for the people. Are you concerned about the statement issued by Senate Majority Leader Fitzgerald saying, maybe you should rethink Craig Thompson's appointment since he was an advocate of raising taxes to pay for our highways, sir? There's no, there's no, nobody in the state of Wisconsin that knows more about transportation policy and, and the options of, available than Craig Thompson. You then expect him to be approved. You've got no plan B if he's rejected by the Senate. No. You don't. I expect him to be approved. Mr. Evers is now the superintendent of public instruction. Mm -hmm. On Monday, he raises his hand. He becomes the 46th governor. He's got to give up the superintendent of public instruction job that he won in... 2009. Two, 9, 13, and 17. Mm -hmm. He then will appoint Carolyn Stanford Taylor, one of the assistant deputies, to his job. And she, assuming uh, that she stays in the position, will not have to run again until 2021. Significance of this appointment? Uh, first African American to lead DPI. That's a big deal. Timing is also interesting. Evers had an option to call a special election uh, right away. By doing what he's doing and appointing a successor, he then clears the way for her to run in 2021, which gives her two years on the job yeah. to get her feet wet, to kind of show what she her vision is for DPI and probably would help um, going forward. It, it's happened once before. Tommy Thompson appointed Lee Sherman Dreyfus, a former governor, to be DPI superintendent after Grover a blank on his last name, stepped down in the mid-90s. That's right. Okay, and she, um, I think she joined DPI in 2000, 2001. She's a former Madison teacher, Madison school principal, and uh, I hope she does a Wisconsin Eye Newsmakers <laughs> interview next week. Hope that happens. Okay, um, new topic. Uh, people like you and I, 
have been wondering what Governor Walker is going to do. Now, I think it was on New Year's Day that he put out a statement mm -hmm. saying, I'm going to be based here, and let's just read it a little bit. Little bit. Tanette and I will broaden our scope with an additional focus on returning power to the states from a federal government grown out of control. That's the best way to drain the swamp. Have you heard that expression? Yes, okay. I have. Yeah. From somebody in Washington, D.C. I will be part of a speaker's bureau, so, so be sure, and this is the part where he says, hire me. Okay, it's really intriguing. Be sure to consider requesting me for meetings, conferences, and other events across the nation. And, oh, yeah, we will help reelect a president and vice president. Surprises in this statement? No, we knew that uh, giving speeches was an option. Now, he's added a new layer of intrigue because he gave an interview to the Associated Press uh, this morning saying that he's not ruling out a bid in 2022 for either governor or U.S. Senate. He just said that this morning? Uh, apparently, from what I read uh, from the Associated Back Press. Back it up. He's not ruling out governor? A bid for governor or U.S. Senate in 2022. You never say never. You okay. know, um, but this plays into the the view of many I've talked to that Governor Walker is a political animal at heart, um, like a shark has to keep swimming to stay alive. He has to stay in politics to keep going. This is what he knows. So now he did say I think in the interview from what I read on social media that you know Republicans want a, a new face, so be it. But he's keeping his options open. Now what we know is that Republicans will need a nominee against Tony Evers in 2022. We also last I talked to Ron Johnson, the U.S. Senator. Um, he has said he's, he's done after this term, which would be 2022. Yes. Now, what's changed, though, since he made those comments, is that there is no statewide elected Republican in Wisconsin other than Ron Johnson. So might that influence what he does? I mean, he could also leave uh, the Senate and run for governor as well. There's all kinds of possibilities out there. That's a lifetime away in politics. But we have a wide open race in 2022 for governor and U.S. Senate. We could see Scott Walker come back. We could see Rebecca Clayfish, Lieutenant Governor. She has made no bones that she probably would have run for governor if, if Walker had become president. Has she said what she's going to be doing on January 8th? Not yet. Uh, so working I, I on that. I haven't heard it either. Okay. But I, I, I should say that it was no secret that Rebecca Clayfish has a, had an eye on running for governor someday and that yeah. if Walker had uh, left and not so sought a, th a third term, she would have probably run. Um, you got to look at Sean Duffy, up in the congressman up in the Wausau Seventh area. History. Congressman Gallagher over in Green Bay, what, what they do because you have also, by the way, a, a, a possible open U.S. Senate seat. Owen oh, Kevin Nicholson, who ran for U.S. Senate and lost, didn't run the nomination for Republicans, what's he going to do? Um, running for the state legislature is not really up Nicholson's alley. He's got an eye on a federal position, we think, so might he run for U.S. Senate? I mean, there are all kinds of names floated. Okay. And now Governor Walker is going to add a new caveat to that field. Now, but where could Walker have gone? He probably could have gone a Trump administration appointment. Possibly. He probably could have headed some nonprofit, or he, caught, he probably could have joined a board, which he may still do, of some major manufacturing company. But he chose the Speaker's Bureau, which keeps him, gives him a high profile nationally, right? Mm -hmm. Possibly. Uh, uh, if you're going to be at the uh, Colorado State Republican Convention, he might just show up there. Mm -hmm. How about the Iowa Republican State Convention? Um, so that's very interesting. You want to guess at what his, if you're, what might his fee be oh, for I have no speaking? Idea. Yeah, good question. 25K? I don't know. Depends what the demand is. But I have no experience I, in that. I don't get paid that much for speeches. <laughs> I'll put it that way. I, I sometimes get a hot dog or maybe a lunch. Um, okay, new topic. On December 23rd, the Wisconsin State Journal reported that uh, Assembly Speaker Robin Voss wants to beef up staffing um, in the next session, adding um, staffers on the budget, administrative rules, and communications. That story said, the State Journal story said, that uh, he and uh, Senate Majority Leader Fitzgerald may draft their own budget. Um, uh, Speaker Voss is saying, we're going to look and say, geez, are there some positions that we should look at and potentially add on? Is this laying the groundwork for their own budget? Oh, beyond that. I mean, Robin, that. Robin Voss is positioning himself to be like the counterweight to Governor-elect Evers. I mean, he, Robin wants to be the leading server voice in the Capitol. He wants the Speaker's job to be the second most powerful position in state politics. He's already there, isn't he? Oh, yeah, but he wants to elevate that, the role because when, when you have the governor of your own party, Walker took the spot. Like, Walker was the lead a lot of things. Now Republicans need a foil, a counterbalance to Evers. Robin wants to be that person. Now there are a couple reasons why it makes sense, too, for him to do this. In talking to people, they've noted that you know, Scott Fitzgerald, Senate Majority Leader, his caucus is much different than the Assembly Republican caucus. His caucus kind of needs to find its balance 
figure things out, and then Fitz closes the deal. Yeah. Robin can be more hard charging with his caucus because he has a, a bigger majority. He can lose members, and it's just the way that that chamber operates. So he has some leeway to kind of you know be more aggressive on some things. He also wants to you know he's been showing signs of being this kind of this voice to counter Evers, and he wants he wants that challenge. I mean, it was clear to people that if in the election, if Walker lost it, Robin kind of liked the idea of, we didn't want Walker to lose, but if he did, there's opportunity to grow as speaker in this new role. Yeah, and you talk about Senate Majority Leader Fitzgerald. He still has a few unknowns in his caucus. He hasn't had a real major discussion with an incoming senators like uh, uh, Andre Jack, Andre Kathy Jacques, Bernier. Kathy Bernier. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't know where his caucus is on some of these things yet. And he'll, as you said, he governs by consensus. And um, so what did the Assembly Democratic leader, Mr. Hintz, say in response to uh, Speaker Voss beefing up uh, Assembly GOP staffers? It's clear that Rep. Voss See, sees himself as the opposition. Partisan power is a major priority a, at the expense of the public and democracy. Um, any potential backlash if you add 12, 15 staffers? It, it depends on how the, how the public views it. You know, it's hard to say. Do they pay attention to those kinds of what things? What do these staffers do that, the, that the, 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 the professional support organizations, Ledge Council, Fiscal Bureau, uh, et cetera, can't, can't provide? Good question. Who are these people going to be? Other thing. But what they've had for eight years is a, a Walker administration with the staff with these expertise and how government operates. It looks like they're looking for these people to come in to help them know how to navigate these, these um, agencies because for eight years they've been run by Walker appointees. Now they're going to be run by Evers appointees. How is that going to change the information they get out of the agencies, how cooperative they are? I know, by the way, I had a couple of Republicans tell me that, you know, their experience with agencies was once Walker took over is that you know he had longtime bureaucrats saying you know I'm not going my way to help you out on how to navigate this place, but with Evers in charge, the fear from Republicans is that these folks who know every inner working of agency X, Y, and Z going oh hey by the way, I know they're trying to make your life more difficult over here, but here's how you do this to make it work. Well, if the speaker adds, I'm going to make up a number eight, ten, twelve more staffers to work on some of these issues. Is there a danger that it could evolve into another, I'm going to use the term, caucus scandal? Oh, I've heard the word shadow caucus kicked around, that this is what it's being built toward. Assembly, uh, 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 Mr. Voss was a staffer during the caucus scandal. But remember, so, that was the caucus wasn't the problem. It was the caucus doing political work on state time, and state resources, and a state building. So if you clearly delineate, these are the staff research, budget communications, and administrative rules jobs, and don't stray into recruiting candidates for 2020, you're okay. And all you have to do, I mean, even with all the things that happened after the caucus scandal, which is, you know, 16 plus years ago now, all you have to do is walk across the street, go to a private office, and you can make the calls. You have to just be off the clock to the Capitol to do the things that you want to do politically. I mean, it's not, it, it's it's a hurdle to go through, but not like it's a huge barrier. So what term have you heard? Shadow what? The, Sha the fear of a shadow caucus. Fear of a shadow caucus. Okay. Well, let's move on. Um, in light of testing of wells, uh, 301 test, uh, private wells, excuse me, tested in Iowa, Grant, and Lafayette counties, 42% of them came back as contaminated. The state geologist said, look, we have some more information to gather here. But when you have this combined with a contamination problem in Kewanee County, uh, Representative Travis Trannell and others from Southwest Wisconsin said, let's create an assembly task force. Speaker Voss says that's a good idea, but it's not just going to look at Southwest Wisconsin, it's going to look at Northwest, uh, the Kewanee County. And uh, according to the State Journal, one-fourth of Wisconsin residents rely on private well water. I think this could be a big issue. It, it was an issue in the November campaigns. I mean, uh, environmental groups ran ads in targeted districts talking about water pollution, about um, animal waste, human waste, uh, lead in their water, yeah. and that Governor Walker, quote unquote, protected polluters, and yours would be a change. I can guarantee you that this study will probably find its way in the mail piece at the very least in a year and eight months, whatever it is, so our next campaign season kicks off. Don't mention next <laughs> campaign season, JR. But these are things that, that end up in campaigns. So you want to be look proactive just so that you are doing something to push back, you know, to try and address the problem. Okay. All right. A filing deadline for the U.S. Supreme Court election, April 2nd. No surprises. Lisa Neubauer, 
who was appointed to the Court of Appeals by Governor Jim Doyle, a Democrat in 2007, is one candidate, and she's opposed by another Court of Appeals judge, Brian Hagedorn, who was chief counsel to Governor Scott Walker, who appointed him a judge in 2015, and then he won a full 10-year term. Uh, is it Court of Appeals? Six, maybe six yeah. years. Anyway. Uh, Meyer in 2017. Is this a repeat of Judge Michael Skronik versus Rebecca Dallet no. in terms of R's and D's? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, Hagedorn is clearly a conservative candidate. Neubauer is clearly the one left of center. But I've already talked to Republicans who will tell you that, you know, they were underwhelmed by Skronik, that he didn't do the, the groundwork they felt like he needed to run a successful campaign. Now, there were other things at play there, obviously, that you had the signs of the anti-Trump wave going on, Dem enthusiasm. They, Republicans talk to you feel like Hagedorn has done more the, the legwork with these groups that will be involved in the campaign. That is important to do. Um, one thing to watch is with Neubauer is, yes, she's viewed as a left of center judge, but she's also kind of running one of the traditional campaigns so far of talking experience and not positions or, or values we heard quite a bit in the right. 2018 race. Right. She doesn't have somebody on the left of her to pull her left in the primary. So how will she navigate that, trying to motivate people and oh, by the way, traditionally, April elections are a little more older, whiter, conservative electorates than they are in November. Um, but with what's happened in the lame duck session, with the Trump stuff still going on, how will the Democratic base react in April with that going on? Is that going to inspire a different kind of turnout come April? And oh, by the way, this race could set the stage for 2020, which would then be for all the beans. What I'm saying is that right now it's a 4-3 conservative majority. Yes. Uh, Justice Abrams is retiring, longtime liberal justice. If Neubauer wins the seat and holds it 4-3, then Daniel Kelly is for control of the court in 2020. If Hagedorn wins, then conservatives go back to 5-2 and have room to lose Daniel Kelly, which is important because you're looking at the possibility of having contested Democratic presidential primary on the same day as a Supreme Court race. If that is going on, edge to whoever the Democratic or kind of liberal nominee is. The counter is that I can guarantee you the, the list of groups that we all see participating in Supreme Court races will go all out if, still a big if, if for control of the court in 2020 to try and counter that Dem surge with a primary. You know, by the way, is President Trump you know, a primary challenger? Well, you know, you never know about that kind of stuff. And Aren't we likely to see the same millions of dollars spent by third-party groups that we did in Dallas versus Skronik? I mean, there was a lot of spending. It wasn't the heaviest I've seen in a Supreme Court race. But it's still... It's still a lot of money. It's still seven um, figures. But it's, again, how does that race shape out? I can see a lot of money being spent now because it sets the stage for 2020. Absolutely. Okay. okay uh, no stock picks this week? Nope. Back, we'll be next, back week. next week. Okay. Uh, before we close, let's... Uh, Let's call attention to the tragic death of Bill Krause, who was 92 and who is a former campaign advisor to Congressman Mel Laird and Governor Warren Knowles, was communications director to Governor Lee Dreyfus, as well as being a private business ex executive for Century Insurance, the Equitable and Frontier Communications. In his later years, he was a respected pundit. I had met with him as recently as November 30th to talk about working on a special Wisconsin Eye project. So uh, I was surprised by his tragic loss, but let's throw this forward. And if you want to be a part of honoring Bill Krause, there's a January 13th, that's a week from Sunday event at Trip Commons in UW-Madison. Uh, Bill, uh, I'm gonna miss you. And we can we should also mention some other uh, leading people we lost in, in I'm sure we won't catch everybody, but Val Phillips first, uh, statewide African-American office holder right. in Wisconsin. Pioneering civil, civil rights leader in Milwaukee. Uh, Mike, Mike Ellis, Ellis longtime state senator, state rep, yeah. um, Senate majority leader, Senate president, colorful character in the Capitol, passed away. Uh, former Senator Chilson, uh, died Christmas Walter Day. John Chilson. As somebody who- Voice of the Northwoods. As somebody who used to write obituaries or type them in, uh, one of my internships many years ago, uh, go read his. It's a pretty interesting read. So it's a good read for an obituary. It I encourage you to do is. that. It certainly is. You and I are going to be very busy next week, but it's going to be pretty cool. When you have the inauguration Monday and things setting up, I'm looking forward to it. Well, then all the work begins. <laughs> then all the work begins. I'm Steve, I'm Steve Walders. And I'm J.R. Ross. That's Rewind for January 4. Rewind. Your Week in Review is sponsored by the Transportation Development Association of Wisconsin. Sharing one goal, 
enhancing the quality of life in Wisconsin through the development and maintenance of a strong transportation network. The Transportation Development Association of Wisconsin. It's how we get there.